keep it like this. Uh, should I ha uh, hide the... Uh, yeah. So um, maybe maybe I start from the beginning. So um, I'm going to talk today witnessing qu uh, quantum gravity by entanglement of masses. And um, as I was telling that uh, six years ago, I was uh, not involved in this, uh, uh, in this game, but um, my close collaborator, Bose, he introduced me to this problem. And uh, since then we started working quite a lot in this area. And uh, now I'm thinking about quite uh, dirty aspects of uh, experiment, uh, which, which is, which turns out to be extremely, extremely challenging, and extremely hard and futuristic as well. But uh, anyway, we'll see how much uh, we can uh, make progress here. So, um, so first paper, a couple of papers were, were written um, by uh, our group, uh, 1707. And then same day, there was another paper by Maleto and Weatherell came in. I would re request uh, to go through these papers if you want to see the details they contain. And then uh, subsequently, we make some progress. And, uh, I, and this is what I will uh, tell you about the story. Um, uh, about uh, various challenges. So what's the dream? Um, we all uh, like to understand uh, quantum superposition of geometries because you see this, that's the only frontier, well, there are many frontiers, but this is one of the frontiers perhaps in uh, high energy physics or someone coming from gravity would like to see because uh, you have seen how matter can be uh, uh, put in superposition, but uh, how can you put geometries in, in superposition? And um, what does it mean by saying that the, the, how, the, how does the quantum uh, mechanics of quantum mechanical system interacts with gravity if gravity is quantum? So some of these things and uh, you know, uh, how, would you, how would you test a very, very low energy? So that's the, that's the dream. Uh, that's the cartoonish picture that you have a Schrodinger cat state superposition on your left-hand side, superposition on the right-hand side, and they're interacting solely by gravity. So uh, when you want to realize this kind of uh, protocol, you realize that you are really creating the tiniest accelerator in the, you know, uh, on Earth, uh, just like a, on your mi microchip. So, so that's the uh, way we, you know, we are thinking right now. It may change, but uh, this is the best uh, I think we can do right now. So anyway, so just to introduce you some of the names. So uh, this is a very small collaboration, but. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here to essentially, uh, you know, uh, uh, talk to all of you, uh, all, all of our uh, um, uh, U.S. colleagues and friends, and uh, it would be very nice if as many colleagues join, because what we need uh, is manpower, which we lack, as well as money to do this kind of experiment. Um, um, so we have colleagues from U.S., uh, some of the name uh, figures you perhaps you know already. Uh, we have colleagues from uh, uh, Israel. Uh, Ron Fallman and his group comes from Israel, um, where, which has the capability to do some kind of experiments, and we have done some experiments with them. Um, and uh, so let me uh, jump into the talk. Now, a very simple question for our community, um, which brings essentially the quantum technology and quantum uh, and the gravity side as well. Uh, the question is that is gravity compatible with quantum mechanics or not? Now, um, uh, you know, if you take all of the interactions, known interactions within standard model, uh, we have tested it, that uh, they all behave, uh, they have the quantum properties. But gravity is the only one, lone wolf, which we don't know. We know very little about gravity. Even classical gravity at short distances, we know very little. And as a consequence, what has happened is that in the theory space, uh, this is what it is, what it looks like. And maybe I'm missing some of the names as well. So it has spread out in so many directions, and uh, in my opinion, it has spread out in so many directions precisely because we don't have experiment. It's very similar to dark matter. There are many, many candidates. And since we don't know, we haven't identified a dark matter particle, we can't really pin it down. So that's the kind of problem uh, from the theory side people are facing. So quantum gravity desperately needs an experiment. Yeah. Uh, what is the conventional wisdom? So you should talk to uh, you know one of the world's best uh, known theorists. They would say that well, the conventional wisdom is that uh, you know quantum gravity is untouchable. You really have to go to Planck length, which is ten to minus thirty-three centimeters and ten to minus forty-four seconds. 
it's, you can't touch that domain. It's impossible. It is uh, the right uh, way to think about it, and that's correct. Um, and even if you look into, for instance, uh, if you go into the photonic uh, domain and you say that, hey, how did you figure out the photon is quantum? So uh, perhaps in this room, you, will, you, you know the story that photoelectric effect for which uh, Einstein got the Nobel Prize, that doesn't show photon is quantum. It's not sufficient. Um, but thankfully, there was an experiment by Rutherford, and then LAM theory came in, um, LAM shift. So it was looking at the fluctuations in the photon field in the QED. And that was uh, got, that got verified. So that was the indirect at that time indirect proof uh, that photon has to be quantum. If you want to do something similar in gravity, again it's untouchable because the effect goes as g square, and g itself is tiny number. So g square is even more tiny number. I can't even test uh, g at very short distance. Testing g square is unimaginable for me. But then then you ask a deeper question. Is it really essential that you should look for effects such as hash bar to say that, yeah, you see some effects of quantum gravity? That's also not so obvious because uh, people look into, say, cosmic microwave background radiation, or people think that, oh, if I just discover one day primordial gravitational waves in the sky, maybe I will say that, yeah, I have seen some effects of quantum gravity. But even that is not so obvious because some of these fluctuations which seemingly looks like quantum can be mimicked by classical fluctuation. So what you need? So you need something more uh, intuitive and something more quantum, both. Um, so one of the things which uh, in 2017 paper, we uh, pointed out that what you need is to build some quantum correlation and something very similar to Bell's correlation, that the way you have tested the nature of quantum mechanics. So you need something like that. And for that, you don't really have to go to say G square H bar effect. You can perhaps do it even at low energy, lowest energies as much as possible. So purely in infrared. So it opens this a window that I can perhaps test the nature of gravity even at low energy. And perhaps that could be our only chance and only domain because we cannot push our LHC. I mean, how much can you push energies in, uh, you know, in the LHC high energy frontier? You can't do that. So just to mention that I think many of you know that there's this famous paper by Mandel, Sudarshan, and Wolf. Uh, we actually uh, pointed out that the, uh, you know, the, uh, the photoelectric effect actually doesn't really say much about the nature of a quantum nature of photons. And then there's a very nice chapter by Bandel and uh, Wolf's book in quantum um, optics. You can look into it, uh, chapter nine. And um, what made photon quantum via correlation was the experiment by Clauser, um, where there are two, um, uh, essentially the photo multipliers, left and then the right. And then you look into some kind of like Quasi Schwartz inequality, build a correlation to show that, yeah, uh, you know, the, the, you can build some correlation in the case of photon. And so this is a famous paper from 1973. So perhaps you would need something like that, some kind of experiment like that in the gravity case. So the plan of my talk is uh, I'll introduce you this uh, QGEM protocol. Then I'll talk about how to read the witness. And I'll tell you various challenges, many, many challenges. There are more challenges than solution. So in a way, it's good because it invites young people to tackle all these challenges. And then I will try to motivate, if time permits me, quantum gravity from experiment. Usually quantum gravity people would say, look, I would proceed from the theory side, but once you have an experiment, you know, it's a billion dollar game now. You can do things from the experiment and try to build the theory. So what you need is that you need to create a Schrodinger cat state, some, as I mentioned already in the very beginning of my talk. And um, so this is what we would need. But, uh, but even before going into quantum gravity side, let's ask the classical gravity because uh, experiments are already happening. Uh, and uh, perhaps already you know that uh, famous experiments were done by Kolila Oberhauser and uh, Werner experiment with the cold neutron. 
now um, um, people have seen the essentially the phase uh, in the microsin sorry uh, in a in an interferometer um, the uh, phase induced by purely classical gravity earth's gravitational potential people also bounce the cold neutron um, and then they have seen the various energy levels of the neut uh, neutrons and in Kastowicz's group uh, you know in Stanford they are built they have built a fantastic atom of, uh, atom interferometer uh, with a, a roughly the uh, you know separation of um, half a meter or so and why uh, and people have measured this phase gravitational phase and people could measure this phase because what appears in your phase is your action divided by h bar and action contains g g square and then higher order in g g and h bar effects but if you look at the lowest order terms you have got g and h bar so g is a very tiny number which appears in the numerator h bar is a tiny number which appears in a denominator, in denominator. so the ratio need not be a small quantity so if you tap into some numbers other parameters you may be able to be uh, you may be able to see this phase and this is what has happened in all these experiments so that gives another hope that yes gravity is extremely extremely weakly interacting a system but nevertheless we might be able to see some gravity induced phase yeah. so a little bit on historical perspective um, uh, because I, I, I'm stationed right now in uh, uh, exactly in this institute, and um, uh, the famous paper came from, um, uh, from uh, uh, way back in 1930s um, from uh, IES uh, by these gentlemen, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, uh, which actually questioned the quantum mechanics, whether quantum mechanical system, the reality, whether you know every every system, everything should have some reality, should give give rise to some real number real valued quantity, but it's not true for quantum mechanics, as we know from the EPR uh, paradox. And then simultaneously the same year, uh, there was a paper by Schrodinger, and he actually coined, um, maybe someone had coined the word entangled states before, but uh, if you look into this uh, yellow uh, part of the, the abstract, he, he, uh, he mentions that what is important or what is inane to any quantum system is an entangled state. And after uh, some 30 years later, Bell, who actually came up with the Bell's inequality test to refute whether the system, uh, whether the system really behaves classically or in, uh, inherently quantum mechanically. So you see that the progress has happened uh, through patches. Um, and now we are asking the questions that how do you really want to test the quantum nature of gravity? And uh, of course, having said so, it would take some years to do experimentally, verify this, but the key ideas are already present. <coughs> so what are the key ideas? So what we need is that we need to create quantum superposition of two massive nanocrystals. And I will come back, come back to you and tell you how massive do we need and the, the, the exactly you would see the challenges we are, going to, we are facing. We are going to talk about the entanglement between these two nanocrystals. And then I will talk about a little bit about the classical communication, which cannot lead to entanglement because the last two criteria actually demarcates between quantum versus classical nature of gravity. So this is the quantum superposition of masses, a cartoonish picture interacting by essentially gravitational interaction. And you see that uh, we are believing the linearity of the trajectories or so linearity of the quantum mechanics essentially the two halves of the, of the trajectory is, uh, the, is independent, yeah? And this is the place where Penrose's, perhaps some of you have heard that sudden collapse due to uh, uh, Penrose's mechanism, he kind of postulates, he doesn't, he has there's no proof, mathematical proof of that, but the postulate is that gravity somehow behaves differently in, in, in such a way that it, he breaks the linearity of quantum mechanics in such a way that these two parts will start interacting with each other. And uh, that leads to sudden collapse of the wave function. But uh, I mean, you can put bounds in the Penrose's uh, approach, but uh, for the timing, uh, there is no theory behind it. So in order to do the experiment, let me just show you, flash you the, uh, the challenges we need. 
we need to create a macroscopic superposition of 10 raised to minus 14 to 10 raised to minus 15 kilogram. The delta x, the superposition scale, has to be roughly 100 micron. And the d is the interseparation between these two interferometers, roughly around 500 micron. And you need to keep the system alive for roughly one second. So you are exactly doing the LHC experiment. In LHC, things are relativistic, fairly relativistic. But here you are bringing two such system. It's fairly non-relativistic system. But you need to make sure that you have you satisfy these numbers. Why? I will come back to that. The first reason, simple reason, is that there has to be some order parameter in the game, dimensionless order parameter. That dimensionless order parameter is the entanglement phase. And that entanglement phase for these numbers becomes roughly order one. So that's one of the criteria. But I will come back to the second criteria, which also tells me why we have to go for these numbers. Why is challenging? Because so far, the best uh, bound we have to create macroscopic superposition is coming from my, uh, Arndt's group in Vienna. That's roughly 10 to minus 23, 21 kilograms. So I need to improve nine orders of magnitude. I need to create a separation of 100 micron. So all these numbers are extremely, extremely challenging. Okay. Can I just ask you a question? If Please. You do this, what will you be able to test? Good question. If you just hold on for a few minutes, then you will see that there are a couple of things which we can test, uh, including physics beyond the stand model. So that's the beauty about this. Now, why, why do we believe in this, that this, this, will, this will work? Why? Because um, some of you know, uh, it's a famous theorem by Bennett and a company and Wouters and many other uh, colleagues have written famous papers in this uh, direction. Um, so we are believing, we are, so we are building this uh, entire story based on entanglement. Now, imagine you have got Alice and Bob to uh, in a quantum system, but imagine if they are communicating via purely classical channel, you're not going to entangle them or you are going to increase an entanglement. Yeah, so that's what the theorem says. So uh, take an example of uh, entangled state from the vacuum Schwinger pair production. Uh, when you create a pair of electron and positron, they're highly entangled. So vacuum is inherently entangled system. So you cannot separate the wave functions. Yeah? You cannot write down the, uh, like a product state as I've shown you for the system A and B. So LOCC, local operation and classical communication, that's what the theorem uh, due to Bennett and company keeps the separable state separable. You cannot entangle them. So this theorem also, uh, uh, you know, is extremely, extremely helpful in order to justify the, the experiment. And as you know, that people create the entanglement witness. Um, so we need some entanglement witness because we need, we need to read this. Uh, how do you read the witness? And that comes, uh, either you follow the basis dependent witness uh, you can also do the, if you, if you have enough time, if you have enough, uh, if you want to make the experiment costlier, you can also uh, measure all possible, uh, you know, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z for all, both the systems. And you can construct concurrence because it's a bipartite system, or you can compute the entanglement entropy, but these are expensive from the experimental perspective. So it's better to look into uh, the entanglement witness for which uh, you see that uh, one particular witness given by our colleagues um, for this particular experiment, which uh, we are talking about, where the, the witness W times uh, the entanglement and the density matrix trace of that has to be less than zero. So that's the witness. If after doing the experiment, if you find that this quantity uh, is actually less than zero, you can conclude that the interaction between these two systems, system A and system B, are mediated by a purely gravitational channel. Quantum gravitational. quantum gravitational channel, exactly. Thanks. But of course, saying is easy, proving is extremely, extremely hard because you would immediately say, how do you really prove that it's only gravity is mediating? There could be long range interactions such as electromagnetic interaction that can also entangle. So how do you make sure that gravity is the one which is playing the role? 
And that's the biggest background for us. And that's the biggest uh, challenge for us as well. Just, just make sure I understand. Sure. If, um, if you start with an inseparable state and you find a way to get it entangled between one of these witnesses, what you verified is that whatever interaction was there was quantum mechanics. Absolutely. Theory. Absolutely. Whether it was gravity or Absolutely. electrostatic. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So suppose if, uh, if you embed a charge, one Coulomb charge, it will, uh, in both the systems, it will entangle by a Coulomb interaction and it will entangle the system. But the only difference is the entanglement uh, will change. You know, the phase will change. The, um, of course, the witness will be positive, but the entanglement phase will be different. And not only that, uh, the, uh, you, you can perhaps make the system neutral, but then you are dealing with a system like diamond or some, any other material similar to diamond, which has uh, diamantic properties. So dipole dipole interaction is always there. So there are, there are numerous challenges. So I, what I will do is I will just illustrate this uh, in a very simple toy model. This toy model is as simple as uh, undergraduate studies, uh, quantum mechanics, nothing fancy here. So imagine that you have got a, two, harmonic, uh, two systems, um, A and B. Uh, for the timing, let's assume that these are harmonic oscillator states because it simplifies your life. Um, and um, A is the harmonic oscillator, B is harmonic oscillator. You have switched on an interaction, H A B, yeah. And assume that is quantum. So what we do in a, a undergrad uh, quantum mechanics, we just do a perturbation. Imagine that lambda parameter is your bookkeeper's parameter, a very tiny quantity, so you can do perturbations. Yeah? So when you do the perturbation, then your initial state will evolve to some final state and just do, uh, 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 if you look into the wave function of the final state, you can actually factorize it uh, in, a, in a Schmitt's basis, number basis, yeah. And then something which is, uh, I've written the, sec uh, the second term, you see that uh, the, that quantity, especially C and N, because A, N and B, N would cancel, C and N signifies something non-trivial. If C and N is non-zero, it means the final state is entangled. And uh, this is the expression for the CNN. And if HAB, if it's a quantum perturbation, it will give you a non-trivial, non-zero uh, uh, number. But if HAB is purely classical, some C number, effectively this CNN will be zero. Yeah. So that's the uh, LOCC part, and this is the LOQC part. Why is LOQC? Because its interaction is this interaction, HAB, is by a quantum interaction. So quantum communication. We're setting up a quantum communication here. So system is exactly as I mentioned. Take two harmonic oscillators, very simple. You know the ground state of the system. You switch on your gravitational interaction. So here you assume that gravity is quantum. So you perturb the space-time, eta mu nu which is Minkowski metric by a tiny perturbation H mu. You assume the H mu is less than one, such that you don't change anything. It's, it's perturbative quantum gravity. Um, and for the timing, assume that there is no electromagnetic background for this calculation. And I will come back to electromagnetic background as, as well, just later on. So this part of the uh, discussion is, uh, is being known from the days of uh, Gupta, then uh, Gup uh, um, Gupta Bloyer, and then also uh, by Cable and David, and many, many uh, people have worked on effective field theory of quantum gravity, um, just across, I mean, people who are here, as well as uh, in Amherst, uh, Donaghue and others have championed this uh, game theoretically. So you know how to quantize this H mean. Yeah, it's exactly like quantizing your photon field, except that now you have a slightly different description because these are spin two components. Uh, in the sense that they are the tensorial component. So there's a spin two part, which you need to quantize. And from spin two, you can also get spin zero component which you need to quantize. So you know the interaction Hamiltonian, which is given by your energy momentum tensor times H mu nu. You have quantized your H mu nu. You know your energy momentum tensor for two harmonic oscillators. You can construct one particle graviton state exactly like the way you uh, construct one particle photon state. So you can do the follow the, through the same uh, prescription and you can compute, you can ask the question. So suppose you have got two harmonic oscillator, 
you switch on your gravity and assuming gravity is quantum, what's the change in the gravitational energy? Because, because of this uh, configuration, your gravitational energy would change because you have added two harmonic oscillators, you have added two matter sector, and you can compute that. And what you get is uh, many people have computers. It's, this part is not new. You match to the known results. These results are known even uh, to higher orders in C. Uh, and our colleagues from Zui Burn and others, they go even higher, I think seventh post Newtonian order and so on and so forth. <coughs> and you see that these are the places where so the key thing is that your Hamiltonian is now uh, operator valued Hamiltonian. So X A hat, X B hat, the momentums are hat, these are quantum operators. And all these interactions between A and B are going to entangle you. So you can compute the entanglement uh, for each and every term at the lowest order. And in principle, you can go to any higher order if you want. You can compute the entanglement. Uh, since you know the harmonic oscillator states, you convert this, uh, these operators in terms of your A and B dagger. And, uh, you, and then you can evolve the state as well. And you can compute concurrence because it's a bipatriate system. So it's easy to compute the concurrence. You can compute it and you, can, you get something non-zero result, which shows that your systems E and B got entangled. Yeah. yeah so these are just positional states or positional uh, ba basis, but you can do the same thing for momentum <coughs> operators. So I have just computed for the momentum operators, uh, P, A, P, B, and P, A squared, P, B squared. So for optomechanical system, you will not get this P, A squared, P, B squared. You will get this P, A, P, B term, but not that, but it's just because as I said, that gravity has spin two interaction. It induces higher momentum terms. And as a consequence, you start getting these kind of non-trivial entanglement um, from, due to gravity. And not only that, you can compute. Now I, I just computed up to, you know, one over c to the power four, but you can go and improve this uh, to all or to any order. And the intuition is very simple. You are, what you are doing is you're scattering dagger. Your mediator is a quantum. Now it's a, <coughs> you can imagine QED is a photon, gravity, in the case of gravity, it's a graviton, and uh, Alice and Bob are the two states, uh, so incoming states of Alice and Bob, and you're measuring the entanglement between Alice and Bob due to this uh, gravitational interaction or photon interaction. So uh, just at the tree level. Isn't the equivalent of the uh, Not really, it's not really. It's not really, but uh, you, for lamp sheet, you need to go for one, one loop, higher order, which is G squared, which is extremely tiny. <coughs> So, um, so what is the protocol? How, do you, how are you going to realize this in real experiment? Now, now this, from, uh, up to this point, it was purely theory. But if you have any question from theory side, uh, please feel, feel free to ask me now. So I pause for a few minutes. If you have any question from theory. Can I go back one slide? Sure. Uh, what is the difference between these two again? Uh, these two uh, uh, Oh, so these two. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, okay, so the difference is that you see that uh, in this, at the lowest order, I got, uh, you know, there are a couple of terms. And so, my, what I'm saying is that uh, I can compute now uh, entanglement due to this term. And these terms, where you see interaction P, A, P, B. Even here also, you, you've got interaction because X, X, B. You can do a you know, Taylor expansion, and in the numerator, you would see that these two terms mix. So wherever there's A and B mix, you start getting interaction between the two system. And that's the place where you start getting entanglement. So what I did is I computed the entanglement separately, just for the purpose of illustration. And by no means is the final entanglement because final entanglement will have all the terms. So I'm just computing piecewise terms. Yeah. And so th this is for just the positional operators. And these are for momentum operators, P, A, P, B, and then P, A square, P, B, just for the purpose of illustration. Yeah? yeah. Does it uh, cl uh, clarify you? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Any, any other question? Well, I guess Please. You're showing a picture with a graviton, but 
this isn't proving it's a graviton. It's just proving it preserves, you know, it's a quantum operator in the sense you already And that's true. That's true. Of course, when you uh, buy the argument of graviton, you are your underlying assumption is that you are believing in uh, low energy effective field theory of quantum gravity. Let's talk about that. Sure, sure, sure. Because you see that uh, in the propagate, uh, what hap uh, happens is that uh, you have the, you, you, you see that you are quantizing both the spin two and spin zero component. Now, you can also claim that, can I take, instead of Einstein's gravity, can I take Nordberg's gra gravity? Nordberg was a Finnish uh, scientist. I think way back in 1912, he came up with a theory of gravity, which was not gravity, spin two, it was a scalar. So there is a way also you can, dis uh, you can distinguish purely scalar mediated interaction versus uh, the graviton mediated spin to uh, mediated interaction. So there are ways you can test it. For instance, um, this particular term, the, the one which uh, here I mentioned, uh, you cannot replicate that by assuming the scalar particle because scalar particle is also attractive boson. So a scalar particle will not generate that kind of entanglement. So there are some distinguish, uh, distinguishing factors which you can, can select. But now the question will be whether the real experiment can do and the first go or not, that's a big challenging question. Maybe the first time you switch on the system, if you only see electromagnetic background, maybe after 10 years of running or maybe five years or two years of running, maybe you will start seeing some interesting signal. But that's the nature of experiment. Okay. So what you do is that you keep in mind that you need to get rid of the first background is your Earth's gravity self is your biggest background. You need to get rid of the Earth's background. So how do you do it? You take two freely falling system. So you have to really put it in a, a, a purely freely falling system. So this one is freely falling, this one is freely falling. How you do it, of course, is another challenge. I'll, tell, I'll give you some numbers, uh, how much freely falling you require. You also need to shield electromagnetic interaction because sooner I will talk about electromagnetic interaction because that's our biggest background. Um, so what you can do is that you can create a Faraday cage, but uh, we have to make sure that uh, the shield, the, 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 the plate which I've inserted here is a perfect conductor and it doesn't entangle with the system. So it, it remains classical. Again, there's a new challenge comes in. How do you make sure, how do you realize this experiment? So the idea here is that you play with a diamond-like uh, system. And as you know, in the diamond, any naturally occurring diamond uh, is not free from any impurity. It always has impurities. And one of the impurities is this uh, nitrogen uh, vacancy. So in that vacant, you can shoot, even if it's a micron-sized diamond, for the masses which I was talking about, these are micron-sized diamonds. So in the micron-sized diamond, the now experimentalists can shoot the and we center very close to the center of your diamond if it's spherical or if it's uh, cylindrical even then you can shoot the, uh, uh, the electron and place the uh, electron in the NV center within the nanometer precision so that experimentalists can do now with the current precision so you know the system you know the hamilton so this is the hamilton you have so this term mg will be zero because I'm doing the experiment in a free falling system. This is roughly the zero point, uh, field splitting, which is not uh, going to uh, affect my system, but the dynamic part and NV color center, because this NV color center is, a, um, is a, the part of the interaction where the spin interacts with your inhomogeneous magnetic field. So you, what you're trying to create, you're trying to create a stern lack apparatus. And if you remember stern lack you have uh, got an inhomogeneous magnetic field and you have uh, got an electron and the electron uh, uh, went on two different paths with the up and down. So now think of it very roughly abusing the language, there's nothing but heavy hydrogen atom with an electron, but it's a neutral system. You can neutralize the charge that you can do experiment. So, so the two terms, so, the diamond has a, uh, has a magnetic susceptibility. As a consequence of that, it also the system also sees the B squared term. So the last two contributions in Hamiltonian plays a role in creating the macroscopic superposition. How large superposition can you create? How massive can you create? Determined by these last two terms. Okay. 
So this is the experimental protocol. And you can compute the entanglement phase. And as I said, this entanglement phase, uh, as I showed you in the very beginning as well, um, uh, this is roughly the entanglement phase, phi effective. And this uh, also includes all the effects of decoherence. If there is a photon you are kicking into the system, even a one photon, it will decohere the system. You shake the box, that will lead to some decoherence. If there is a, a collision, so absorption, so, uh, if the photon, if the system absorbs a photon, that will lead to decohere the system. If the system releases a photon, that will lead to decoherence. The collision decoherence, as I mentioned, if the neutrino passes by, that will lead to decohere the system. If a butterfly flutters and passes by, that will also lead to decohere the system. You name it, everything will decohere the system. And you need to protect this apparatus extremely, extremely well. How well can you protect it from any other interaction? That's the art of the game. So you can compute the, uh, all the decoherence rates and you can set the decoherence rate uh, the, according to the experimental uh, you know, constraints you, you have, but that's the entanglement phase, the one which I have written phi effective. And uh, the phi effective, as I mentioned very beginning, is order one for these range of parameter space. One second is important because what you want is that you want to repeat the experiment many, many times. And you can do a, some ca a calculation how many times, if you want to say, yeah, 99% confidence level, I can say something positive about the experiment result, then I have to repeat it, say 10 million runs. 10 million times one second, you see roughly a year or more than a year. So, I mean, I cannot wait a billion for seconds, for instance, then it's the age of the universe roughly. So I need to make sure that experiment is finished, one run is finished within a second, so one second, two seconds, roughly of that order. Okay. I cannot go for a minute. I, I, I mean, even if I have the technology to create, keep this coherence for a minute, it's too late for me. So, so the idea is very simple, as I said, that what you are measuring is the witness, and if this witness is less than zero in this uh, basis dependent witness, if it's less than zero, trace of W rho, you can say that, as Dave said, maybe you don't have to buy the idea of graviton, but what you can ascertain to answer your question as well, that the curvature or the space time has been put into quantum superposition. Yeah, and the interaction has been purely due to quantum nature of gravity. Now, whether it's a graviton or whether it's some other, uh, you know, interpretation that's least, that opens up the door for a different interpretation. But as I said, at the lowest level or at the least, if I buy the effective field theory of quantum gravity, that photon is my quantum. And I, be, I believe that, that uh, you know, the graviton is the one which carries the gravitational interaction. I can say that the graviton is quantum entity. So it's a very clean experiment but extremely, extremely hard experiment. But if you can ever do this experiment, uh, it will be amazing. As I will show you the challenges, just to control the challenges, just to you know, um, tame these challenges, uh, you require amazing amount of technology. So why these numbers uh, also will become clear, because as I said in the beginning, that this is a diamond, diamond has a dipole, it has a magnetic properties. So the, uh, the dipole will start having interaction. It's a two photon exchange diagram. It's nothing but a kind of like Casimir interaction, Casimir Poldrex. So uh, funny thing is that uh, my, my house is next to the Casimir land. So I come from Groningen and the next uh, uh, road is uh, uh, named after Casimir. So anyway, so you can compute this uh, diagram extremely well as, uh, in, a, in a vacuum, zero temperature, you can compute it. And you have to make sure the gravity induced phase is at least 10 times this phase due to occurring due to uh, Casimir. And uh, these parameters which I've showed you satisfies that. For the range of uh, you know, uh, um, these parameters, you satisfy that the phase is at least 10 times. And so you, 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 you're, you're making sure that gravity always dominates. As I said, that having said so, it's not easy because it can have some defects. It can have some fast potentials. You need to, these are part of your systematics. You need to make sure that none of these things spoil 
my result. And that's the reason I need to do you know, many, many uh, runs to build the statistics. I cannot conclude anything about uh, from this experiment just by one in one run. And I need to do million or more than million runs to build some statistics and say, hey, 95% confidence level, I can say that this quantity is less than zero. You see the challenges. And I have left some dots because there are some unknown unknowns, which I cannot even figure it out right now till I start doing the experiment. So you have to prepare the initial state, you have to levitate the system in you know, some trap, and maybe in an iron trap, preferably, then you have to neutralize it, you have to send it to your stern girl axe, and then you have to tame all the, the cooling the diamond internally. Uh, now, right now, I mean, uh, uh, Aspel Myers group, uh, you know, perhaps in Vienna, they have managed to, uh, you know, um, center of mass, they have reached the center of mass cooling for a nano diamond, something like 10 to minus 9 Kelvin. But that's not sufficient. I need to cool the entire bulk of the system because they are phonon vibration. So you see, not only center of mass cooling, I require the bulk cooling. And you need to preferably cool that bulk roughly below 4 Kelvin from the... <coughs> Otherwise, it will start decohering your spin or the envy center spin. So they are <coughs> switching on the current fluctuations, creating superposition. Perhaps you know the Humpty Dumpty problem is due to Schwinger, Scala, and uh, Anglais. I will, I will touch upon this problem because it turns out if you want to tame that problem, you need incredible amount of uh, control on your current. And if you can manage to do that, that itself will be amazing, you know, achievement. Uh, avoiding black body radiation, maintaining spin coherence, uh, avoiding scattering, collision with air molecule means you need to create one of the best vacuum. So the vacuum which you need to create there is roughly one part in 10 to 15 Pascal. Just to give an example, this is the level of vacuum Gabriel has obtained in his laboratory. In, a, in a LSC, in the, when the, where the proton, proton beam collides, that's the kind of vacuum you need. So, but so we believe that that can be achievable. <coughs> and uh, next week on Monday, I'm going to meet him. So I hope to have some interesting communication with him. And so there are many challenges. You can compute only the known no knowns, but as I said, that there could be known unknowns, uh, unknown unknowns. Uh, that could be due to the material property. If there's some defects, if there's something else, in, uh, you know, if the, uh, if there's a, uh, you know, if, if the internal structure has some new, dopants or something that will everything will spoil the coherence of the system so you pay a heavy price for the coherence but so assuming that you can tame all these things and if you can do the experiment it will be perhaps the most delicate sensitive experiment ever done on earth so that's the claim i'm making because it is of that nature so uh, recently uh, as i said that uh, with uh, colleagues in uh, israel we managed to create this uh, uh, superposition and atom chip. So this is the first uh, uh, proof of, uh, you know, existence kind of like experiment, uh, proof of concept experiment that you can take a rubidium atom of uh, roughly 10 to minus 21 kilograms, and you can create a superposition, you can close one loop. So that's what we have. I mean, our colleagues have, I'm not the experimenters, I'm mostly from the theory part, but it was done by Yael who is actually in MIT in um, Kettle's lab right now. So that's what we have shown as a proof of concept experiment towards a uh, test of quantum gravity. But you see now 10 to minus 21 kilogram, and I need to do, go all the way to 10 to minus 14, minus 15. So again, a big task ahead. So now what we are uh, in our group, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to create this macroscopic superposition for uh, heavy masses, as you can see, uh, the right hand side of the plot, the superposition size for different masses, 10 to minus 17 kilogram, minus 16, minus 15 kilogram, keeping the coherence time. These are very idealistic calculations because uh, name of uh, what we are trying to do, we are trying to achieve as big superposition as possible because even if I achieve say thousand micron superposition with a very heavy system, when I put it into the experiment, it will be perhaps one micron because there are many uncertainties I have to tackle. So, so right now we are trying to engineer or design 
uh, you know, uh, systems where I can get as big superposition as possible theoretically, because when I really put the system uh, under various, uh, uh, you know, constraints, maybe the superposition size will reduce to at maybe 10 micron. And my goal is to reach 100 micron. Keep in mind. So right now, this is what our, we are trying with different uh, gradient in the magnetic field. We are playing with the linear magnetic uh, field profile. Uh, then we are playing with the, because you are imagining is uh, through the, you know, chip current. So current goes one over R, but in a short distance, you can do a Taylor expansion. So you have a linear term and then nonlinear terms and so on and so forth. So that's what we are trying right now. And we are trying various techniques to create this large superposition. And the reason why it's so hard because of the B squared term. So B squared term, you see that in the, in the, in the, in the potential, so you have got two terms, B squared and S dot B. S dot B actually determines the two paths, spin up and spin down. That's the one which separates. But the B squared term is like a harmonic oscillator potential, which tries to bring you down to the center. And as soon as you come back to the center, you destroy the coherence. So the B squared term tries to destroy the coherence of so the system, tries to destroy the, uh, the superposition. So it's a competing between B square and S dot B term. And this is what you need to play with to make sure that you get sufficiently large superposition. So there, there is a challenge here that how do you get large superposition in the system? Um, <clears throat> so these are uh, some of the uh, 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 just numerical uh, analysis, what we have done in our group uh, to create the superposition size in different stages. So right now in this particular example, what's happening is that you're oscillating. So from zero to 0 0.2 seconds, you're oscillating. And then it's like a catapult. You're catapulting the two halves, the two parts of your trajectories, like spin up and spin down. And you're trying to create a, a parabolic trajectory for both the sides. And then uh, say, let's, uh, say 0 0.7 seconds, you're trying to bring them back via oscillations and closing the, uh, the, 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 the superposition, yeah, the stern girl hat. So there are various stages and this is becoming uh, you know, a much harder task. It's not so easy to get very, very large superposition. But, but we hope that it is possible. We are hoping that it is possible to get large superposition. Now with various constraints, we have to take into account uh, uh, such as decoherence effects, the coherence of the spin and all those things we need to take into account. And then we'll have to see that how, you know, how much we can get in a real life. One of the challenges to just to illustrate this challenge, it's a beautiful challenge. Uh, it's a challenge for experimentalists and theorists as well. As, as I said that uh, you need to make sure, so the two paths has to come, the, the position and momentum, they have to match, but that's not sufficient. You're playing with the spin. You want to measure the spin at the end of the day, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, and sigma x, sigma y, sigma z for both the interferometers. So you need a spin coherence and spin coherence Larger is the better, yeah, because that's the place where you see the real uh, interference pattern. So you want to get at least 99% uh, uh, you know, uh, spin coherence. So this quantity is sigma xz, so sigma xc. So I've just taken one particular sigma direction, spin directions with component, which sigma x, you can do it for sigma y, you can do it for sigma z as well. <clears throat> so capital delta z tells you how the two paths are wiggling. Suppose if there's a butterfly passes by, then this path will change a little bit because there is a gravitational potential, yeah? And small delta Z is your inherent uncertainty in the paths. So you have to take into, you have to minimize this factor, delta Z over delta Z and delta P over delta P. Smaller, the better. And phi T is your phase, entanglement phase is hiding there. And that phase is governed by your external magnetic field. So just to give an example, so I was talking about the gradient. You see that in this, in this uh, example, I have played the, uh, with uh, the stack of eta, and that's the gradient in the magnetic field. And so you can ask the question, how sensitive this parameter eta would be? Just one, one example I'm picking up. You can do the same game for every parameter. You can play with beta naught, B naught. You can play with uh, any other parameter. So suppose you ask yourself, how good my eta has to be? You see these numbers for 10 raised to minus 17 kilogram in the momentum direction, it has to be as good as one part in 10 to 11. I, sh I, I should know the 
value of eta, one part in 10 is to 11. What is creating eta? Is the current flow, yeah? So I need to current perhaps that how many electrons are passing through my wire within the size of my uh, cross section of my wire and um, how much time, you know, it has, it has to be known one part in event better than one part in 10 to 11. No one has achieved that. So I need a very good understanding of how current is going. And even, even if I understand this factor, if I switch it on, switch it off, it's going to dissipate heat. If it dissipates heat, it's going to destroy my experiment. So I need to find, just by this example, I'm, I'm illustrating how hard it is to do the experiment. Not only I have to have an extreme understanding of the sensitivity of the current, but also I need to find a ways to dissipate this heat in a way that it doesn't decohere my system. Just one example. Now you can play with every parameter you have in this problem. But yeah, so it's extremely, extremely hard, but nevertheless, if you can achieve it, it will be amazingly good result. I talked about uh, Earth's gravity. So I'll go through very quickly. So any motion, even the button, just to give an example, forget cars, planes, seismic noise, those are there. But even a butterfly, which is a very tiny mass, if it passes through your experiment, or your superposition is going to destroy the coherence of the system. So you need to make sure that you take into account of all these uh, uh, you know, jerks, all these uh, sudden acceleration movements. And uh, you, you need to achieve something like one part in 10 to 15, one part in 10 to 17 meter seconds per second square, square root of hertz sensitivity. So if you need a, one of the best, this will be one of the best sensors one can ever achieve. Uh, in a, a range uh, we are interested in, like 100 microns or millimeter range, that's the acceleration which we can tolerate. So we need to go below this range. So we need to shield this experiment. And one of the cartoon picture is that, suppose I'm doing this experiment below the New York City, and I really have to do the free fall experiment. Um, and I need to create a, um, uh, you know, so you have to embed it. So it has to be a better structure in the most, uh, central part where I'm doing the experiment, the pressure has to be one part in 16. Maybe here the pressure is slightly low, but again, a very good vacuum, one part in 10 to 10. And the more I shield the experiment, the better it is for me. What can we learn more? Uh, there are many things which you can learn. So from the theory side, you can learn, the, uh, first of all, the foundations of quantum mechanics and gravity that, uh, you know, such a heavy system like one part in 14, one part in 15, mesoscopic system behaves like quantum mechanical system. So the first thing you learn just by creating a superposition. Is gravity classical or quantum? You can uh, get the you know, uh, answer from this, hopefully from this experiment. If you believe it's mediated by a graviton, you can ask the question, is the massless, it's massive? What are the degrees of freedom it has? Is it really spin two or is it really spin zero? You can ask this kind of questions, fundamental. You can also test, uh, for instance, if there's a gelatin hypothesis, like in the sense string theory has extra degree of freedom. This gelatin which may, can mediate. So that can induce also entanglement. <clears throat> Amazing thing is that we can also do entanglement tomography. And maybe if time permits, I'll tell. You can test quantum equivalence principle. Um, you can probe very high frequency gravitational waves and you can build quantum sensors. Just to give an example, which, uh, <clears throat> maybe interesting for the community here. Uh, actually, maybe I, I can I can skip that. I can come to here. We can do very interesting tomography. Um, so this idea is based on. Uh, so far, I was talking about neutral particle. You can also do this experiment with a charged particle. But interesting thing with a charged particle is that Coulomb. There's a Coulomb interaction. Yeah. So the Coulomb interaction can try to repel depending on the charges, but the Casimir can try to attract. If you can balance these two forces, and if you can, so if it's a very delicate balance, it will never balance, but if you can bring fairly close to this uh, minimal uncertainty point, not uncertainty, minimal potential point, and you can measure the entropy there, so it's a one moment's entropy with respect to time, you can actually, so this is a part, so here what you're doing is that you are minimizing the entropy due to Casimir and due to Coulomb, and at this point, 
if you see, so this is a theoretical plot, you know what's happening in theory, but in experiment, if you see anything on top of it, you can say that, hey, there's something beyond the standard model physics. Something there beyond your Coulomb and Casimir, but these are the two leading monopole and dipole interactions in QVD, uh, quantum electromagnetism. So that's a very interesting way of uh, picking out some new physics beyond the standard model. You can actually put constraint on <clears throat> Yukawa type potential. Um, so these are the uh, these are the plots which you have seen uh, uh, constraining the Newton's potential uh, beyond Newton's potential, purely classical Newton's potential. You can constrain. This is the part for uh, ex extra dimensions for n equals to two, two large extra dimensions, and this is the uh, bound comes essentially from string theory side. If you imagine that you are con uh, compactifying in uh, Calabria manifold six of the dimensions out of ten, so you can put some constraints like that. You can do axon searches. So imagine you have uh, essentially the, the, the diagram is very interesting. You have <clears throat> you have got this diagram. Um, so you have got a uh, QED diagram, the photon, but now you can imagine there's axion loop. So depending on the coupling, GA, GA, and the uh, mass of the axion. So you can play with this stuff. Of course, you don't know this coupling. You don't know the mass of the axiom. You can actually be sensitive to this diagram for this experiment, the one which I was showing you. For the Charles And you can place some constraints. Very interestingly, you can go to much, much smaller masses. This is the mass range for the fuzzy dark matter. But now you can prove the region almost 10 orders of magnitude in axion mass through this experiment. So there are many things which you can do. You can test the weak equivalence principle, but I, my time is running out. Um, I can talk in, uh, in private, um, but uh, you see that today's science fiction is tomorrow's reality. So, you know, creating long co coherence, best levitation device, best vacuum on earth, ground state cooling, unprecedented control on your current, you know, innovative material science. <clears throat> All these things are very, very interesting for young people, more than our generation. This is for essentially for future generation. Some of the key publications are here, but uh, hey, this is what we want to do. We want to realize, beam me up, Scotty. So join the community and uh, it, 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 it is not a one person job. It's uh, so many problems, so many challenges. We require a community to uh, you know, contribute towards this uh, amazing experiment. So thanks, thank you very much for listening.